we'll get started with uh, estimating some of the performance characteristics of helicopters. As we had mentioned in a previous slide, this is done in three ways. First, we look at the hover performance. Hover means you're standing still, you're not moving in forward direction at all. So we'll do the hover performance first. And uh, it, we'll do it in two ways. One is a very, very simple back of the envelope technique called the actuator disk model, which is what this set of slides is talks about. Then we will do a little bit more sophisticated manner. So the first part of the helico helicopter talks about the hover, vertical climb, uh, vertical descent. You know, these are the topics that we are going to be covering. Then we'll go to forward flight. Then we'll look at the performance. So we are now in the hover. So the theory that we are going to develop here is called sometimes called the actuator disk model, but it's more widely called a momentum theory. So this has got a long history. As early as 1865, people were developing not aircraft propellers, but marine propellers. Rankin, you know, we know him very well from uh, thermodynamics, the Rankin cycle, degree Rankin. Froude is a famous engineer known in uh, civil engineering, hydraulics, and so forth. You may have come across the number called Froude number in your engineering analysis. So they were looking at how do I estimate the thrust generated by a marine propeller, and how do I estimate the power needed to produce that particular thrust. So they were coming up with some early theories in the 1865, 1885. Then um, after the, uh, the uh, aircraft has been built, helicopter has been built and flying, uh, the, they, uh, there was uh, some uh, people found that the, the power required is slightly higher because there's a loss in the swirl of the flow. So when you move forward, the propeller pushes the air backwards, that's how it produces thrust, so you're, you're creating some extra energy to the molecules. So that's one source of energy that you're supplying to the air, but you're also supplying a, a totally unnecessary component of the energy, which is the swirling motion of the fluid behind the propeller. So Betts extended the theory of Rankin and Froude and then uh, he came up with a more, uh, more, uh, more accurate methodology around 1920. This can do standing still in hover. It can do a vertical climb. So what we are going to do is we are going to develop a general case of vertical climb. And then if you set the vertical climb velocity to zero, then you get this hover standing still in the air as a special situation. So that's how we are going to be proceeding in this particular lecture. We have to make some assumptions. This is a very, very crude back of the envelope theory. Therefore, what it does is we are going to construct a very, very large control volume that surrounds our rotor or our helicopter rotor. Or in the case of Fruit and Rankin, the marine propeller. In the case of Glovert, airplane propeller. Anyways, you put a very, very big box when you look at the balance of mass, momentum, energy, how much mass comes in, how much mass goes out, conservation of mass, how much momentum is coming in, how much momentum is going out, are we having more momentum, more momentum leaving, it means we have added a momentum to the molecules. As a reaction, the molecules have given you a force on your propeller, so this is how thrust is generated. Then we also look at the conservation of energy, how much energy is flowing into our control volume, how much energy is flowing out. So if more energy is leaving the system, that means we are adding the energy to the system. This is what the propeller does. It adds energy to the molecules. Wind turbine, on the other hand, extracts the energy from the molecule. So it deals with the global conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. He does not particularly worry about the details of the blades. Now, what is the shape? What type of aerofoil are you using? You can knack a aerofoil. How many blades do you have? Is it a tapered blade, twisted blade? None of these. Is there a shock wave sitting on the blade? No, none of these are done. So therefore, it gives a very good representation of what's happening far away from the rotor. 
because it's such a back of the simplifying back of the envelope theory, it makes a lot of assumptions. The nice thing is at the end of it, you get a formula that you can write on a piece of paper, back up the envelope, literally. Then if you have a calculator, or just a very simple spreadsheet, you can do a lot of calculations with it. So um, what are the assumptions that it makes? First of all, it says no matter how many blades are there, they're lying in a circular disc-like area. So I'm going to model it as an actuated disc, which looks like a, you cannot tell the blade from the surrounding air in the disc. It's just a, some permeable circular disc. The air goes in, somehow receives momentum, receives energy, comes out on the backside of the disc. Okay. So this disc is called an actuated disc. Also, it assumes the flow is encompassable, at least in the far field boundaries, where we are going to do the conservation of mass, momentum, and energy for the most part. It's in reality, this is true. Helicopter blades, locally, you may have transonic flow on the blades. You may even have shock waves, like we talked about. You may have separated flow, whatever. But very far away, it's a relatively low velocity molecules low velocity forward flight or low velocity climb. Therefore, the flow is considered encompassable. We are not going to concern ourselves about boundary layer viscous losses. So we'll assume the flow is inviscid. We are also not going to worry about the vortices that are generated in the wake, tip vortices and swirl. All those things we are not going to cover. Of course, we're going to assume the flow is steady. We know it's not steady because the blades are finite number of blades. So if you are staying very close to the blade, you will see some unsteadiness. Think of a ceiling fan. If you get very close to the ceiling fan, as each blade passes by you, you, you will see a buffet of air. But if you stay very far underneath, you see a steady stream of air coming down. So it looks like a steady uh, outflow that the actuated disk is uh, producing in the far field boundaries. So we assume the flow is steady. Again, there's no vorticity, there's no swirl in the wake. Okay. So this is what Rankin and Froude model. Later on, uh, Glover added swirl effects, so we are going to address it sometime later. So the control volume we are going to look like it is look like this. This is a very confusing looking picture. I would like to walk through it, walk you through it. The middle blue re rectangular shape is the side view of your rotor disc. I use the word disc uh, loosely. It need not be a circular shape. Of course, if you have a single rotor, it may be just a circular disc-like shape. So this blue disc that I'm showing you here is a circular circular disc. But if you had a tandem rotor, you'll have a one circular disc in the front rotor, another circular disc in the rear rotor. So when you project it, you'll form a symbol that looks like a master card, like an infinity symbol, you know, double circle overlapping each other. Okay. So it's the overlapping area is what we are looking at. It need not be circular. So the actuating surface area projected is A. If it's a single disc rotor, it will be just pi r squared. But if you have a tandem rotor, because they overlap, the overlapping region would be a smaller area than the sum total of the individual discs, individual of the front rotor and the individual area of this rear rotor. Okay. So anyways, this is the rotor disc. Surrounding it, you have a very large uh, control volume, far above, far below. This need not be circular, cylindrical shape, or anything like that, okay? It could be, a, for all we care, a rectangular box above, rectangular boundary in the bottom, rectangular, or uh, anything you want, you know, cylindrical, far field boundary, doesn't matter, okay? So now the area of the top surface, you know, whatever shape it is, this area is called S, okay? S is the area of this boundary. It's a three-dimensional surface through which air molecules are entering. 
our vehicle is vertically climbing upwards at a velocity v. Therefore, if from the perspective of the rotor, you would see wind coming towards you at this velocity, capital V. Okay. So this top boundary is called station number one. Now the region just above the rotor disc or the actuator disc would be called the station number two. The region just below is called the station number three. And then this entire bottom boundary very far underneath is called the station number four. So this area is still S is the area, same as S is the area. Now what I have shown here is what happens to the molecules when it comes comes here. This acts like a giant vacuum cleaner. Okay. Vacuum cleaner pulls all the particle towards it. Okay. Therefore, molecules start migrating towards the actuated disk, migrating towards the actuated disk. Therefore, you form a stream tube, which is a collection of streamlines that approach the rotor disk. They don't stop right here. They continue to contract becoming smaller and smaller, eventually they become a constant diameter tube. This is called a slipstream, you know, if you will. Okay. So this area of this region inside the stream tube is much smaller. So we are going to call it area 4A4. By the way, the rotor disc has got an area A because whether it's a station number 2 or station number 3, above the rotor disc or below the rotor disc, you have the same area which is pi r squared. Because the stream tube is contracting, this is like a contracting nozzle or a, a contracting duct. When the area decreases, the velocity increases to pump the same mass flow through. Density times area times velocity is the mass flow. So all the molecules that enter here, they need to pass through this, but through a much smaller area so if you assume density is not changing a lot, density is the same, the area is smaller, then the velocity has to increase. So this is the excess velocity that the molecules pick up. We call it an induced velocity at station number two. This is the excess velocity, induced velocity at station number three. This is the excess induced velocity at station number four. Now if the stream tube is contracting like this, you can't have a vacuum here. So laterally molecules, they rush towards the propeller or our actuator disk, but they never cross the actuator disk or flow through the actuator disk. These particles just enter through the side boundary and they leave through the bottom boundary. So that's what happens. This can be observed experimentally, you know, either in a water tunnel, that's probably what Fruit and Rankin did, and in a modern wind turbine, in a wind tunnel or a hover facility, if you inject smoke particles, you would see that they would go like this. They would go like this, like a contracting steady stream. If you introduce a smoke here or smoke here, it will pull, be pulled towards the rotor disk, but then it will push downwards. So this is an external induced velocity that's caused by this rotor disk. So this is what we have. Now we are going to look at the conservation of mass. We are going to see how much mass is going through the top boundary, how much mass is leaving through the bottom boundary. The difference must be coming through the side boundaries. Okay, so we are going to do the conservation of mass first. Remember the top boundary has got an area S, capital S. Velocity is V. Therefore, the mass flow rate for the top boundary is density times climb velocity V times the area of the top surface. Okay. We don't know how much is entering through the side boundaries. We don't know all this mass. So collectively, all this mass is entering is called M dot. We'll just like give a symbol M dot 1. Okay, that's how much is entering through the side boundary. If you come to the bottom boundary, it's made of two pieces. One is outside the slipstream, okay, which is this part, this part. The total area is S. The slipstream area is A4. Therefore, the rest of the area is S minus A4. 
So these molecules, when they cross the boundary, when they come down here, they do not have any excess velocity. They have the same downward directed velocity, capital V. So they're leaving the bottom boundary at the velocity, capital V. On the other hand, the molecules here are leaving at a higher velocity, V plus V4. So there is a difference in the velocity inside the slipstream compared to outside the slipstream. So we split this into two parts. This is outside. You have the climb velocity. That's the downward velocity. This is the area of the outer area. This is the slipstream area. This is the extra induced velocity. This is the climb velocity. Now, all the inflow, this plus this, must equal all the outflow, this one. So do a very simple sum. Then rho Vs will cancel out with rho Vs. Rho Va4 will cancel with rho Va4. So we'll be left with rho V4A4 equal to m dot 1. So this is how much mass is entering through the side boundaries. So we have done a conservation of mass for the entire outer control volume. Okay. Now we can do a conservation of mass just for the rotor disk or our actuated disk. So what we are going to do is we are going to look at uh, how much mass is crossing this above the rotor disk. It is rho times V plus V2 times disk area. It better leave through the bottom boundary, which is rho V plus V3 times disk area. So we equate rho V plus V2 times disk area. This is entering the rotor disk above the rotor disk. This is immediately underneath the rotor disk. So this is the mass flow rate m dot through the rotor disk. We notice that rho has canceled, a4 has canceled, v has canceled, therefore v2 must equal v3. Therefore there's no velocity jump across the rotor disk. So we, instead of using two numbers, station number two and station number two, we can just give it a no subscript at all Therefore, this is called the induced velocity at the rotor disk. Same amount above, same amount below. So this is what we get. Next, we look at the conservation of momentum. Again, we look at the top boundary. The area is S. Remember when I say top boundary, we are talking about this area. So the entire area is S. Velocity is V, so rho times V times S is the mass flow rate. Multiply by V again, rho times V squared times S is the momentum inflow through the top boundary. Side boundaries, we know how much mass is coming in. We have already found it. This is the mass coming in through the side boundary. So it's, it's coming at an angle. We are only concerned about the vertical component of velocity because we're looking at the momentum along this axis. So the vertical component of velocity is still this capital V. Okay. The side wave motion is because of the suction produced by this actuated disk, vacuum cleaner-like effect. is pulling the molecule towards it. So when you use a run of vacuum cleaner, some particles go through the vacuum cleaner, but even surrounding air will rush towards it. So that's what's happening here. But the vertical component of velocity is V, so m dot 1 times capital V is the momentum entering through this boundary. We already know m dot 1 is rho V4 times A4. Therefore, the momentum entering to the side boundary is rho A4 V4 times V. Then we come to the bottom boundary. It's got two areas. One is inside the slipstream. It's got this area. This is the velocity, so density times velocity times area is the mass flow rate. Multiply by the velocity, that's the momentum rate leaving inside the slipstream. Outside the slipstream, this is the area, this is the velocity. So pressure on all the boundaries is ambient. So we don't need to find the pressure force at the top boundary or the bottom boundary. This is the reason we did, did it this way, so it took us such a large control volume. So if the outflow momentum is higher than the inflow momentum, rate of change of momentum must have been caused by some force. 
that force is what we call the thrust. Okay, this is the force exerted by the rotor on the molecules. The reactionary force, upward force, is exerted by the molecules on the rotor. So you take the momentum outflow minus momentum inflow, which is this and this. Then you'll find many things cancel. This rho v squared s will cancel with rho v squared s. This rho a4 v4 v will cancel when you expand this. You'll have a lots of things canceling uh, canceling with each other. After after a while, you'll get the thrust equal to rho a4 v plus v4. This is the mass flow within the slipstream. This must be the same as the mass flow through the rotor disk because what is uh, coming out through the slipstream pass through the rotor disk. So we are going to call that m dot. m dot is rho times a times v plus v. 2 is same as 3, so v2 is same as v3, so it's v plus v. Therefore, the thrust is m dot, which is rho times a times v plus v times this excess velocity v4. So this is the expression that we get for the thrust. Okay. Now we can get another expression for the thrust by looking at the conservation of momentum, not over this our giant control volume, but a small control volume surrounding our actuated disk. So this is our actuated disk. This is the control volume. It's very, very thin, infinitesimally small, so this side area goes to zero. Now underneath you have a higher pressure P3, above you have lower pressure P2. But the same momentum is coming in, same momentum is going out. So there's no rate of change of momentum taking place because the velocity, is, there's no discontinuity, the velocity. But we do get an upward directed force P3 times area pushing it up, the rotor disc up. This one pushes it down. Therefore the net thrust is P3 minus P2. So this expression for the thrust we get from the conservation of momentum on the rotor disk must match the thrust we got from the global conservation of momentum. But we cannot, when we compare the two, we find this is all in velocity form and velocity squared form. These are all in pressure form. How do I reconcile these two? Then we scratch our head and ask which equation links pressure and velocity. Euler equation, but that's a differential equation. Then we recall Bernoulli equation. Bernoulli equation, conservation of energy, links pressures and velocity. We know that Bernoulli equation can be applied along a streamline as long as there's no body forces. That means you can apply the Bernoulli equation from one to two, energy is conserved. Then you can apply it from three to four, energy is conserved but we cannot apply it from two to three because the energy is added by our actuated disk. Okay. We say fair enough, I'm just going to apply it from one to two first. <coughs> Pressure energy, P2, plus one half right times kinetic energy, which is V plus V squared, equal to pressure energy at one, which is P infinity, plus one half rho V squared. This is the climb velocity. So molecules looks like it's coming towards here. That's station number one. Going to three and four, this is pressure energy at three. This is the kinetic energy at three. The velocity, there's no discontinuity, so the same kinetic energy. Here the pressure is P infinity because it's a far downstream. Kinetic energy is one half rho times this velocity squared. So if you subtract P3 minus P2, this goes away. You, you get P infinity goes away, you get this minus this. So if you expand this binomially, then as I cancel one half rho v squared from it, you get this as the expression. This is P3 minus P2. We know thrust is area times P3 minus P2. Therefore, if you multiply this by area, you get an expression for the thrust. So compare this with m dot times v4 that we developed some time ago, m dot times v4. This is the mass flow rate in the slipstream at the bottom. 
This should be the same as the mass flow rate through the rotor, which is rho A V plus B. So mass flow rate through the rotor times V4. So compare this and this. Rho is there, A is there, V4 is there. Capital V, which is the climb velocity, is there. So this V4 over 2 must equal V. Therefore, the induced velocity is V4 over 2. Alternatively, the induced velocity at station number 2, 4, way downstream, is 2 times the induced velocity at the rotor disk. So this is the bigger picture. Way above, you have only the climb velocity. So sitting on a helicopter, it looks like air is coming towards you at a velocity V. Half of the acceleration takes place by the time you hit the rotor. So this is half the excess velocity has taken place above the rotor disk. But the stream tube continues to contract, velocity continues to rise. So the remaining half of the acceleration takes place between here and here. So far wake has got twice the induced velocity compared to what is happening at the rotor disk. So this is the relationship that Rankin and Froude came up with. Both are British people. Okay? Fortunately, no, no Frenchman thus far. Now, can we estimate the induced velocity? Yeah, if you know the thrust, you can estimate the induced velocity and vice versa. Everything else is known. This is the density. This is the disk area, pi times r squared. Or the oval after disk area, if it's a tandem rotor, you know, oval shaped 228, crisscrossing each other, so it makes a mass record like symbol. This is the climb velocity. So if you know rho A and climb velocity, you can either solve for the induced velocity or you can solve for the thrust. You have to be given one, solve for the other. So let's assume that you know the thrust, then this is a quadratic equation for velocity squared, induced velocity squared. If you solve for it, you'll get this expression. We notice that there are two roots, one is positive, one is negative. We know that a negative will mean a negative induced velocity. That means this stream tube, this velocity is small and this is the less velocity. That means instead of a contracting stream tube, will have an expanding stream tube. You are basically removing energy from the flow. This takes place in the case of a wind turbine, for example. But in the case of a helicopter, we know we are adding energy to the flow. Therefore, the small v has to be positive. So we have to pick a plus sign here to make sure this is a negative number, but this is a larger positive number. So the net result is a positive number. Therefore, this is the expression that we will get. In hover, the climb velocity is zero. Therefore, as a special case, the kinetic the induced velocity at the rotor disk is this value. Now, how about power? It's very easy. Energy out minus energy in. This is far upstream, way above the rotor disk in the slipstream. So we are talking about here. Velocity is V, so m dot one half times m dot times velocity squared is what is the energy flowing in. Here the energy flowing out is one half times m dot times v plus two v squared. So energy out minus energy in. This is the uh, algebraic va value. Now this m dot is density times area times v plus v. So when you do that, you get density times area times V plus V, v plus uh, V, v okay, which will produce a thrust. Then you'll get another V plus V here. So we could show that uh, uh, M dot times two, 2 V times M dot V is, this is the thrust. This is the excess velocity, therefore thrust times velocity, this is the power. This is the climb velocity, so this part of the power is to increase the potential energy of the vehicle to climb up and down. This is the induced power that you are imparting to the molecules to give it an extra velocity. We already have an analytical expression for this little v. 
So let's plug this in here. Then you get this is the power, ideal power. Ideal means no viscosity, no vorticity, no shock waves, no swirl, no tip losses, nothing. So I, this is the ideal power is what we get in here. Okay. Remember our human powered helicopter example we saw in the previous video? It had a W, W over 2 rho A. So that's what we are seeing here. So if you have a very heavy vehicle, power will increase like that. Weight, power three, three halves. That means weight times square root of weight. If you have a tiny rotor, it takes a lots of power. That's why vertical takeoff and lift helicopter like a Harrier or an F-35 that gets off a ship deck. By the way, it's got a tiny propeller-like device buried inside the wing. That's how F-35 gets off the ground. Because the disc area is so small, it takes a lots of power to get off the ground. Also, if the density is low, high altitude power flight, then the power would be higher. So in summary, according to momentum theory, the downwash in the far wake is twice the induced velocity of the rotor disc. We developed an analytical expression for the induced velocity in here. We also got an expression for the ideal power in climb and in hover. The actual power would be higher because there are losses in the system which we had neglected. So the ratio between the ideal power that we just estimated from our ranking theory, fruit theory, and the actual power is called a figure of merit. It's defined only in hover. So it's the ideal power which is which we just we just got there the actual power. In a few slides from now we are going to non-dimensionalize thrust into a non-dimensional coefficient. We're going to non-dimensional the power into a non-dimensional coefficient. So I'm kind of giving you a look ahead of the non-dimensional expression. For most rotors, it'll be between 0.7 and 0.8. It does not mean a, a rotor with the efficiency of 0.7 is a bad, bad design. Uh, although, you know, every every percentage of figure of merit improvement means less power consumed. Therefore, uh, uh, the less fuel consumed. Okay. But if you try to make the uh, a power figure of merit very, very high, you'll end up with a highly twisted rotor. There'll be a lot of vibrations. You can also reduce the power by increasing the area, but it'll produce a very large, unwieldy vehicle. So there's a lot of limitations on how large a rotor disc you can use. Remember, you have a tail rotor. You need a main rotor, tail rotor clearance. If you have such a large main rotor, center of gravity is too far, then the fuselage has need to stick, stick uh, adjust itself, perhaps a longer tail boom. Uh, you know, so the vehicle will get unwieldy bigger and bigger and bigger. So helicopter design, you are limited in how large a rotor disc you can have for the ideal power, which limits the actual power, which, which requires the appropriate amount of actual power. We will show how to design a rotor that's got a good figure of merit a little bit later in this course. So a figure of merit of 0.6 or 0.7 is not uh, bad. It's been optimized for other situations such as high speed forward flight rather than for a low, sea, low, low speed flight or just mostly hover. Many of the helicopters will spend a lot of time in hover or a very low speed loitering flight. Then you design it based on hover for high high figure of merit. But if your maneuver is very important, you don't want to have a very huge rotor. It's a, you know, it'll be take forever to roll, turn, and so forth. Small rotor disc, high power consumption, low figure of merit. It's not necessarily a bad rotor because it's been designed for high speed forward flight performance, for example. So let's look at a, a numerical example. A tilt rotor vehicle has got a gross weight of 60,000 pounds. The rotor diameter is 38 feet. 
remember there are two rotors one on the one wing tip other one is another wing tip assume a figure of meridia 0.75 you have engines powering the rotor but when you convert the shaft horsepower from the engine to the rotor power you have lost 5% in the gears and the gear mechanisms and so forth so there's some transmission loss and then you are asked to compute the power needed to hover at sea level on a hot day. Okay. So this is how you will estimate it. Okay. You are given a diameter 38 feet, so disk area is 19, 19 foot radius pi r squared. Density is sea level. Since we have two rotors, if this is the total weight, each rotor has to lift only half the weight, so this is the thrust it needs to lift. So the first thing you compute is the induced velocity using the formula in hover. You get almost 75 feet per second. Downwards in the far way could be almost double that 150 feet per second. If you try to convert this into miles per hour, multiply this by 3600 divided by 5280, you'll get almost a 100 miles per hour wind in the wake. That means tilt rotor helicopter, if it gets off a ship deck, it's going to produce a hundred miles per hour wind on the ship deck. Everything needs to be tethered, including the ground operators, you know, the others they'll be blown away into the ocean. When you try to land in a desert like uh, Afghanistan or Iraq, it's going to keep uh, kick up a lot of dust. Pilot can hardly see where they are going. This is called a brownout condition. If you land in snow, like in a, uh, an area like in New York or Canada or Northern Europe, it's going to kick up a lot of snow. Then you'll get something called a whiteout condition. Visibility will be impaired. Okay. Anyways, you get a very, very high induced velocity. The ideal power is thrust times induced velocity, which we developed in here. The actual power would be ideal power divided by the figure of merit, which has been given here, 0.75. This is per rotor. For two rotors, it will be double that. There's a 5% transmission loss, so you need another 5% extra power. So this is the total horsepower separated by the engine to the shaft. Even though we have a twin engine a tilt rotor vehicle, you should design it for a one engine out condition. That means one engine has failed, the other engine is still producing power to lift both the rotors, producing dismiss thrust from one rotor, this from the other rotor. Otherwise, if only one rotor is producing thrust, not the other one, you're going to roll, roll and hit the ground. Or in the ship deck, you're going to hit the ship deck, or the water and crash. Okay. So this is a one engine out condition. Each of the tilt rotor vehicle should supply this much horsepower. Notice that this is nothing like a 100 horsepower car engine. This is tens of thousands of horsepower. Lots of power is needed to lift this vehicle. What happens on a hot day? Density goes down, P equal to rho RT. What's up on a high, high, high altitude? Again, density goes down. When density goes down, this induced velocity goes up. The ideal power increases, the actual power increases. So what happens if the rotor disk is smaller? Then same thing happens. Induced velocity goes higher, power requirement goes up. So there are practical limits, of course, to how large a area it can be. If you have a very large main rotor, then your tail boom has to be large to provide adequate clearance between the main rotor and the tail rotor. If the tail rotor gets too long, center of gravity shifts too far back, your vehicle becomes unstable, then you'll have to make the nose of the fuselage longer, shift the center of gravity forward. All you, before you know it, you have a very, very large, unwieldy vehicle. So there are practical limits to how large a disk area you could get. The quantity T over A is called the disk loading. The higher the disk loading, the higher the induced velocity because the T over A occurs inside the square root here. 
higher the induced velocity, higher the power consumption. Helicopters have a large rotor disc, large pi r square, large rotor radius. Therefore, they will have a low disc loading between 5 to 10 pounds per square foot. That's how much they can lift. Okay. Tilt rotor vehicles will have a disc loading much smaller, 20 to 40 pound force per feet squared. In this example, each rotor is 30,000 pounds divided by 1,100. If you take this by this, it's about 28. It's the disc loading. 28 pounds per square foot. Okay. So that's the tilt rotor vehicle. VTOL vehicle like Harrier F35, they'll have a tiny disc area because in the case of an F35, the disc is buried inside the airplane wing. You have a gate window that opens, sucks in the air. Bottom, there's a window that opens, pushes it out. That's how you're getting off the ship deck. But because the disc is so, is so small, the T over here is very, very high, induced velocity very, very high, power requirement is extremely high. By the way, thrust to power ratio is called a power loading. How much horsepower does it take, or how much power weight I can lift per horsepower? Helicopters can lift 6 to 10 pounds per horsepower, not a lot. So if you want to lift a human weight like 160 pounds, they need a 16 horsepower minimum. Tilt rotor would require even, you know, even uh, um, um, uh, less, weight, less weight can be lifted per horsepower. Vita vehicle can lift even less per horsepower. Okay. So the power loading varies like this. I promise non-dimensional numbers. So this is the thrust force. In world and NASA notation, there was a one-half rho area times velocity squared, just like in an airplane. But in modern NACA notations, the one-half is, uh, in modern helicopter notation, one-half is not used. We don't use the wing area. There's no wing here. We use the disk area A. We don't use the free stream velocity because the vehicle may be in hover. Therefore, we use the tip velocity. So thrust, power, and torque are non-dimensionalized this way. In hover, power is angular velocity times torque, P equal to omega times Q. So if you put another omega here, then that omega times Q will become P. That omega R times omega R squared will become omega R cubed. Therefore, CQ is the same as CP in hover. So we can now express our non-dimensional induced velocity divided by the tip speed is called the induced inflow ratio, or simply induced inflow lambda i. It is this expression. So now if you take this omega r inside the square root, t over rho a omega r squared is ct. The rho will get the square root of ct over 2. How would the figure of merit? Thrust will become ct. Induced velocity will be it becomes square root of CT over 2. P will become CP. So this is the non-dimensional way of computing the figure of merit. Okay. Now we are going to take into account, correct the ideal power which we got, which is T times V. We're going to correct up crudely for viscous losses, drag, viscous drag of the rotor. So the blades have a wetted area. There are aerofoil sections. So as the blade spins through the stationary air, it experiences a resistive force, a drag force on the surface. So to overcome the drag, you need to provide some power. So this power, we call it a profile power because the drag is called a profile drag. So we're going to use the symbol D prime for the drag per foot of span or per meter of span in our derivation here. So this is the airfoil, a typical section somewhere on the blade between the root, which is r equal to zero, and tip where r equal to capital R. This is some station, omega r. So this airfoil sees forward velocity omega r because it's spinning. It sees that induced velocity v, 
Therefore, it sees this uh, blue line. This is the total velocity. Now, the drag force is this purple line is going to be parallel to this blue line. Now, this V is very small compared to this because this V already saw this is like a 75 feet per second, you know, for the tiny rotor. Large rotor will be like a tens of feet per second. Whereas this would be like a 300 feet per second, 400 feet per second, hundreds of feet per second. Therefore, the red line is larger than blue line. Therefore, this blue line is more or less like the red line. Okay. So we're going to neglect the induced velocity. Therefore, this purple line is parallel to the red line. Therefore, the drag force times omega r is the profile power. Because the drag is pushing it this way, you need to supply power to push it forward. So drag force times omega r is the profile power. This is per foot of span or per unit span. Now, drag is related to CD by one half rho, velocity squared times the chord. Now, this induced velocity is much smaller than this uh, omega r squared, so we're going to neglect it. Therefore, this is the expression. Therefore, the d prime can be written in terms of CD as CD times one half rho times C times omega r squared, that is the d prime. Now, power consumed per foot of span is d prime times omega r. You integrate it, bring all the constants outside, assume constant density, constant chord, nominally constant cd, constant omega. Then you pick up an r cubed ddr will become r power 4 by 4. So r cubed times r. 4 times 1 over 2 will become 8. So this is the profile power. Therefore, the power that we need, previously computed power is called the induced power. This is the profile power. If you non-dimensionalize this by rho a omega r cube, like we always non-dimensionalize the power, a is pi r squared. Here you have a bc, you have another r here. Then you'll get a bc over pi r. This is, by the way, is the blade area, number of blades times each blade has got a chord R times radius R. So this is the blade area, rectangular area, times the number of blades. This is the blade area divided by the disk area is called the solidity. Typically, solidity is between 0 0.05 and 0 0.1. So the rest of the term is CD over 8. So this is the non-dimensional expression for CP. So CP induced is this, CP profile is this. When you add the two things, you get this expression. This is the induced power, this is the profile power. We have neglected some other components of uh, induced power due to non-uniform inflow, tip losses, swirl losses. We will cover that in a separate lecture. So this expression is empirically corrected by adding a factor kappa. So this is the power this is the power required for a rotor. So if you redo that uh, that uh, tilt rotor, you will now get a slightly higher power needed because previously we just had this stuff. Then we were using a figure figure of merit guess assumed value. Now, since we have a more accurate or a better estimate for the power, figure up merit is CP ideal, which is CT times square root of CT over 2, divided by this CP. That's the figure of merit. So this concludes this particular, uh, particular section. So we are ready to stop the recording at this point.